so glad that you are here today. Just want to say to all those who are joining online today, we're glad that you're here. want to ask that you'd pray for Barb Kelderman. I know that she's watching today. Hi, Barb. And uh, she, she's gone through a series of radiation treatments, finished with that, but just really physically feeling uh, down. And so I encourage you to pray for Barb, believing for healing for her. Dorley Cavender is in hospice. I've got to see her. I'm sure Dorley's watching right now. Hi, Dorley. Um, just a few months ago in May, she was working full time and uh, had a diagnosis of cancer, uh, retired, started going through treatment. Treatment didn't work. And, and so here she is in hospice. And uh, I know she uh, wasn't on her radar to be where she's at right now, but uh, we talked to her this week as she was in hospice and, and uh, said, I, uh, I don't know why I'm still here. I'm just anxious to go to heaven. And I hope that that is our, our, all of our heart to say, you know what, I love being here, but if I got a chance to go to heaven, I'm, I'm looking forward to that too. So pray for Dora Lee. She said, don't pray for me to walk out of this place. I just want to go to heaven. So... Um, that's, that, that is a, a great testimony. Hey, stop in the lobby today just with our Attend One, Serve One places, opportunities to serve. We have our early childhood department uh, always looking for volunteers there. It takes a lot of volunteers to make that ministry happen. We've got a lot of kiddos, and uh, so there, there are plenty of opportunities there. I encourage you to plug in, especially if you're not serving anywhere. It's, it's a blessing to you. I, I can't tell you the countless people uh, in our church who made an investment in our kids' lives through that early childhood years. And they're like aunts and uncles and grandparents to my kids even to this day 20 plus years later. So uh, it, it's a great opportunity to make connections uh, with families and kids and so appreciate the people that serve there. And uh, also you'll find out there a table for choir and orchestra. Our choir and orchestra are beginning uh, practice for Christmas. So they're looking for more, uh, more people. There's more chairs in the choir loft, and we encourage you. You don't have to audition. Try out for that. If you love to sing, do that. If you play an instrument, we'd love for you to get connected with the orchestra. And uh, just stop by, ask questions, and uh, find, a place, find a place for you to serve. So today we continue in our uh, series, We Are New Hope. And um, I, I hope this has been good for you. It's been good, I think, to remind us, to review, to remind ourselves who we are as a church. And for people who are new, it gives a little bit of an insight, some information that I hope is helpful to understand who are these people that I'm checking out here, who are these people that I'm committed to connecting with, and uh, who are they, and, and who are they becoming. Like, like clay in the hands of a potter, that's, that's what we want to be. Not saying we have everything figured out, we don't. Uh, we just want to be moldable, let God shape us, make us who he wants us to be individually and as a church. One thing that I can tell you that you're not going to get with New Hope is a trendy church. We're not, we're not a trendy church, that's for sure. I mean, look at this big pulpit I'm preaching behind. Um, We've got a choir, uh, they're not singing today, and an orchestra, but uh, we, we're anxious for them to get back involved after the, after the summer's over with. I, I'm wearing a suit with a tie. That's just not trendy, okay? I'm not saying, I, I mean, I, I could wear whatever up here, I'm, I'm sure, you know, but the thing is, is, you know, we just, I, I'm not doing this to try to set a new trend, it's just, this is just me, and uh, this, is, this, is how we, this is how we do it, I mean, we have Sunday school. There, there's a trend away from Sunday school. We got a Sunday night service. This is just who we are, how we know how to do church. And we believe that it's in, 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 all those things have value and importance, and we're gonna continue doing that. So we just, again, wanna be who God uh, designed us and created us to be and fulfill his purposes. So as we continue in the series, the, the message of the title, the title of the message this morning is we are godly. We are godly. I would say that there's probably no greater compliment that could be paid to a follower of Jesus for someone to say, you are godly. You're a godly example. You're a godly uh, person uh, just because I see Jesus in you. As I thought about how to preach this message this morning on being godly, I, my mind went to a lot of things. When I, when I think about being godly, I, I I think we're, we're representatives. 
And of course, you know, as we go to our workplaces where, where, where we do life, uh, we, we're representing this church, but ultimately we're representing Christ. And so we're representatives, we're ambassadors uh, to this world, and we certainly want to wear that title or that label or that description that we're godly people. There's something contagious about that. But when I think about being godly, my mind went to a lot of different things. The first, one of the first things I thought of was holiness, Preaching about holiness. To, to be holy is to be set apart, to be separated, to be consecrated to God for whatever he wants to do in and through our lives. First Peter 1.15 says, be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. Multiple scriptures in, in, in the Bible where God says, you be holy even as I'm holy. That, I mean, there, that, that, that preaches for a series for sure. Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to be holy because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Obviously, holiness and godliness uh, go together. When you recognize a, a godly person, you see uh, not only the person, but you see Jesus in them. And it's, it's his holiness, his characteristics and his qualities it's his transforming power that allows us to to love people as he loves them to to respect and reverence God and his power and to live holy lives Uh, I also thought of conviction conviction is something I think that we need more of today I, I think back to the 1980s there was a contemporary Christian artist by the name of Carmen anybody heard of Carmen Carmen had a song called a little a little bit more conviction and I was listening to that song yesterday, and, uh, I, and I realized that song was 40-plus years ago. The lyrics would be quite different today. But the, the reality exists that I think that there are a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of Christians, who need more conviction. What, what do we mean by conviction? A, a, a biblical conviction is, is being convinced that God and his word are true. And it's not just an opinion that you hold, but it is a a firm belief that defines who you are. This, I'm convinced that this is the right thing. Not that you're legalistic about it, but you're saying, listen, I believe this with all of my heart, and nothing is gonna change me. Not the circumstances, not the the situation or the people uh, at all. I'm just convinced, and this is what I'm gonna do. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, They had conviction that they weren't gonna worship idols. And so when they were forced to bow to the idol, they they continued to stand because they had a conviction that God was the one true God and that they should not bow to anything else. I think of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter five. Um, What says godliness like the, the fruits of the Spirit being worked through your life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I mean, if we can get all of those, those fruits um, producing in our life, you know, I, I think, you know, they're not gonna say, look at your love, or look, it's, it's gonna just say, you, that's, I see God in you. The fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's purpose coming into a, a Christian's life is to empower them and enable them to live a transformed life. The Holy Spirit full in us and working in us conforms us to the image of his son so that the, there's evidence, the characteristics, the fruits of the spirit make us more like him. I also thought of uh, salt and light, Jesus' words in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, where he said, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Shine, I mean, that, that, is, that is being godly, right? Being salt, being light. Are, are you salt to the, the, the world around you? Is there something about your life and how you interact with people that uh, when, when, when they leave you or they, they realize this relationship in their life, that they just always encourage me and make me want to be more like Jesus. They just leave me feeling a little thirsty and hungry 
for the things of God, being, being light to the people around us. There's a distinction between being a, a true follower of Jesus and the rest of the world. And if we ever depart from being spirit-filled or spirit-led like Pastor Austin talked about last week or uh, being a, a, a true disciple of Jesus like Pastor Luke mentioned three, about three weeks ago, um, our testimony and our witness is gonna be hindered and diminished. We need the spirit in our life. We need, to, we need a commitment to be disciples. So I think of holiness, conviction, the fruit of the spirit, being salt and light. All of those could preach and probably could have series. I, I, I really feel like, you know, as I, as I was thinking about this, we are godly. I mean, we could, we could do a long series in this, living godly lives in an ungodly world. We, we need more of, of all these things. But as I looked in the scripture, it says enough about being godly and, and godliness in, in our lives as, as believers, as followers of Jesus, that is very, very convicting. And so um, the words godly or godliness really don't appear that often in the New Testament. But then when I think about it, the whole, the whole book is about being godly, Right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. Paul's words to Timothy. He says, Timothy, you, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. He's saying pursue righteousness. Pursue is very active. You have to be intentional. Pursue godliness. In 1 Timothy chapter Four, verse seven and eight, Paul again says, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourselves to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. So there's benefits to, to being godly, and he says, train yourselves to be godly. Train, just like you would train physically. I mean, we've got... We've got churches everywhere. We've got gyms everywhere. Gyms are almost like a church these days. I'm not going to ask who belongs to a gym. But, but physical training has value, and I'm glad that people are taking advantage of that. But he's saying, listen, there is much more to gain from, from spiritual training, from God, training in godliness. It not only helps you in this life, but in the life to come. All, all of those muscles that you've built in the gym over the last few months, you know, when this body is done, it's done. It's all decaying. But there is there's, um, benefits for eternity with training for, for, for godliness and righteousness. And also look at Second Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 3. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature, to share his divine, to be like him and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. I'm reading from the New Living Translation that says this, supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and supplement moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness. Supplement godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to, ve to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the Bible's telling us to pursue godliness, to train ourselves to be godly, and to make every effort to live a godly life. There's a lot of action involved in that. This is what it tells me. Godliness is not optional. 
For all of us who identify with Christ, for all of us who are believers in Jesus, for all of us who are disciples, godliness is not optional. It's the responsibility of every disciple. It's not just a label for a few older people to wear. It's not just regarded for a few super, super saints. Godliness is for all of us. It's something that we ought to work at. If I asked you to define what, is, what does it mean to be godly, give me a definition for godly. There's a lot, a lot of ideas. I know the first thing that we would say would be, oh, like godlike or Christ-like. But I'm, I'm thinking of all the attributes and qualities of God. If we're going to say we are godly, we are like him, how do, you, how do you narrow down your definition? It's really, really hard to think, how would I define what it means to be godly? And here's the, the definition as I thought about it, what I think uh, godliness means, and it's simply this, taking God seriously. To be godly is to take him seriously. It's respecting and reverencing the things of God. There's an account in the Old Testament of a, a group of people who failed to take God seriously. It's the, the Israelites were in captivity in, in Egypt for hundreds of years. And on their exodus from Egypt to the promised land, they experienced a miraculous, uh, amazing thing as God parted the Red Sea and, and saved all of their lives and all of the Egyptian army that were in pursuit of them died in the Red Sea. They had everything. They had not only been delivered from the Red Sea as God guided them, uh, but they, they, uh, they, they were led in the wilderness with a, a cloud by day and a, a pillar of fire at night. He provided nourishment with manna from heaven and water from the rock. God's presence was constant with them. He was working in their lives uh, uh, daily, and it was evident that God was with them uh, and providing for them in every way. You would think that these people would be the epitome of godly people. God's with them. He's doing all these things for them. He's working miracle after miracle after miracle. But as we read an account in 1 Corinthians, Paul references these people, and we find that they were not godly people. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Paul says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the, in the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. That rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them. God wasn't pleased with most of them. Not a, not a great testimony. And their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of them did. As scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and died uh, from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and, and they were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us, and they were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. He's saying, let's, let's step back and take a look at the Israelites in the wilderness. God was with them, and God provided for everything that they needed. Yet they turned their backs on him so quickly. They got themselves involved in things that they should never have done. All the time, God was with them. I mean, how many of you have ever said, if God could just be with me, I mean, his, if, if God could just manifest his presence with me all throughout my day, all throughout my week, I know it would be so much better. God was manifesting himself daily to these people. And they still turned their backs on him. They still disobeyed him. They still didn't trust him. These things were recorded as a, as, a, as a witness to us of what not to do. They were playing games with God. Supernatural things were happening all the time. They, they just became ordinary and commonplace to them. They became calloused and nonchalant, apathetic toward the things of God. Really what happened is they forgot their heritage. They forgot where they had come from and their relationship with God became nothing. Does that sound... Similar. 
like anything maybe you have seen. The United States has been an incredibly blessed nation. We are inundated with churches. Churches everywhere. We've got Christian radio, Christian television, we've got podcasts, Christian magazines, Christian books, Christian schools, conferences, seminars. Most churches in America are streaming their services today. We have a plethora of the gospel going out. We are inundated with all of this stuff. Our churches should be overflowing with godly people, but are they? Where, where, where is the godliness? I mean, I think, why are these seats not filled? You ever wonder that? Do we take God seriously? Are we pursuing godliness? Are we making an effort in our lives daily to live godly lives? Herb Cain, longtime columnist for San Francisco Chronicle, wrote this short article. He said, every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows that it must run faster than the fastest lion or it's going to be killed. Also in Africa, every day, a lion wakes up. And that lion knows that it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. So it doesn't matter if you're a lion or a gazelle. You're going to wake up in the morning and you need to run. Right? It's an incredible picture of us pursuing godliness. It's not enough for us just to wake up. We got to run. We've got to live godly lives. Listen, we can't make it without God. I'm on a mission to get through this life, and I'm on a mission to go to heaven. And I'm on a mission as a follower of Jesus to take as many people with me as possible. Are we doing that? Are we living those kind of lives? It doesn't come to us by sitting passively waiting for it to just drop in our lap. It doesn't come to us by sitting in church on a Sunday morning. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes perseverance. Like the lion and the gazelle, you've got to run with everything that you've got. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I believe that every person here today has a desire and strives for being content. It's really the human condition. It's kind of the American way. We're looking for fulfillment, to be complete, to be satisfied. But when you look around at the culture of our day, do you see that happening? Do you see people living satisfied lives, fulfilled lives? I don't don't see it happening. What I see is discontentment. I see dissatisfaction. I see people being unfulfilled, incomplete, empty, and as lonely as can be. I think that more describes the culture that we live in today. Why is that? Why are so many people so discontented when that is the focus of their life? I just want to be happy, fulfilled, and satisfied. Why are we coming up short? This verse contains the secret to contentment. What is it? Godliness with contentment is great gain. It's godliness. John Piper made this statement, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied with him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Imagine yourself feeling totally complete, and sufficient, satisfied, fulfilled, and lacking absolutely nothing. That's what scripture means by contentment. And the only way that comes is godliness. We're not gonna be able to find the contentment on our own. We are, we, are, we are examples of that. But listen to this scripture. This is one that I think everybody in the room knows this scripture. And you say, I don't have scriptures memorized. Psalm 23. 
Verse 1. Whether you have it memorized, you know it. The Lord is my I I shall not want. The uh, NIV says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Does that sound like contentment to you? This is a verse that we have quoted, that we've used, that we've heard over and over and over and over again. How many of you in your minds, you've connected the dots? The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. I shall not want. I lack nothing. You have everything that you need. The Lord is your shepherd. But you have to want godliness. You have to be willing to pursue it. There are no shortcuts. I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you would say this? Pastor Jeff, I'm trying to follow God. I'm trying to be, uh, live a godly life. But you admit that the problems of everyday living, your job, family relationships, finances, your health, maybe a death, age, whatever it might be, has blurred your vision and has gotten you derailed a little bit. You say, I, I'm trying to live a godly life, but there is so much going on in my life. I've got issues with my job, relationships, finances, you name it, all these things, and they seem to distract and derail me. How many of you would say, that, that, that kind of sums things up? Bible verse that I memorized when I was young. I was probably 10, 11 years old. I was in a, in a class at my church for fifth and sixth graders and we had to memorize like 20 or 30 verses of scripture. So I never knew at that time in my life that that was gonna be so meaningful to me. Well, one of the verses that I memorized uh, when, I was, when I was 10 years old, fifth grade, was Romans 8, 28. And we know all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. There's a lot of different versions. I learned it in King James. I'm gonna use that, the new King James version, and I'm gonna unpack that verse a little bit because I think that this is a connector. This is a connector verse for us that takes us from everyday kind of life and living a godly life. It's a verse that connects them, those two things. You see, the next verse after Romans 8, 28 tells us what God's purpose, because it says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And the next verse tells us what his purpose is, and that purpose is to be conformed to the image of his son, which really means what? To be godly, to look like Jesus. So if we wanna be godly, listen, you're in the right place. You're living in America. You're living in the world. A world that has problems and problems that are growing every day. Do you identify with that? We live in a world filled with problems, but this is the perfect place for the experiment. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God wants us to be more like his son. This is what I want to tell you. God is in your problems. God's in your problems. I'm not saying God is your problem. I'm not saying that at all. But your problems, God's in the very middle of all of those. It, that problem might be the result of your own doing. It may be something that you did, you messed up, you made a huge mistake. It could be something that, that came, circumstances completely beyond your control. But listen, regardless of where that is, all things God works together for good to those who love him. That changes everything. How many of you have heard that verse before? This verse somehow became like something that I just like stuck a stake in the ground and I just decided, I believe that verse, that all things work together for good. It has got a narrow, a narrow focus of who it applies to. All things work together for good to those who love God. Listen to me. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to him, this verse applies to you. This verse does not say all things work together for everyone. This, this applies to you as a Christian. Okay? It's got a narrow, narrow application. But it, it applies to you. Listen, he is 
the master planner, and he is much more capable of managing your life than you are. And he's promised to work things together for good. And what he's saying is, I will use all of the pieces, I will use all of the problems, and I will fit them into my plans, and I will fulfill my purposes for you. Isn't that a great thing? Why do we worry about anything? Because everything, all things, God is working it for good and for his purpose. And his purpose is to make us more godly. Man, this, I, you guys, I thought there would be greater reaction to this than that. <laughs> Notice the first three words. I'm gonna go through this really quickly. And we know, and we know. What do we know? What do we know? You see, there's some things in life that we hope for. There's some things in life that, are, that, that we can hope about. And, and, and what I'm talking about is temporary, temporal things in this world. But it's the eternal things that we know. Let me, let me give you this example. You might store up your treasures here on earth. You might have some treasures that you're storing here. I have a, a Michael Jordan rookie card that, I, that I've got stored somewhere. This is how valuable this thing is to me. I put it, I put it in a plastic sleeve, but I can't even tell you where it is today. It, it's a, it's worth, they say it's worth about $1,800, but I've tried to sell it and I can only get a couple hundred for it, but still, it's a piece of cardboard. And I, and I know this thing has value, so I've held on to it, and I'm storing the treasure. But you know what? I, that thing could be lost. Somebody could have taken it. I have no idea. We have treasures that we've stored here on this earth. A couple of weeks ago, there was a, a minister in Iowa whose, whose house burned. Thankfully, no one was in the home. But I don't know how many of you have had that experience where your earthly treasure, your home, where your sanctuary is, where all of your important things are, to, to lose all of that in a fire. Listen, we, we, we hope that everything's going to be okay. But you can store your treasure in heaven and you can know that there moths and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. What we store here on this earth is so temporary and it, who knows what's gonna happen to it. Your 401k that you put all this effort into for decades, do you realize it in a day, in a moment, it could be gone. We put a lot of effort and work into that but we have no control over those things. But the promise is store up your treasure in heaven and it will be perfectly fine. Here's another example. I'm alive right now, and I hope to be alive tomorrow, but I have no guarantees. That's true for all of us. We have no guarantee that our tomorrow will happen. But I know that if I die today, I'm gonna be in heaven. So it'll be like I go from death to life and I have eternal life. Because anyone is in Christ has eternal life. So with God, I know I can depend on him because I've seen him do things. I've seen him work things together for good. We sing a song sometimes, I've seen you move, I've seen you move mountains. And I really believe, God, that you can do it again. Even when I can't see it, God, I know that you're working. And we know, we know that God is capable of doing anything. He's sovereign, he can do whatever he wants to. We know all things, not some things, not most things, not just the nice things, not the easy things, but all things, even the hard, difficult things, all things from the smallest, most insignificant to the most severe crisis, God works all things together for good. He works, not he might work, or he should work, but all things work. You've probably thought, or maybe you've even said this before, I just don't see how any good can come out of this situation. Ever said that before? How can anything good come out of this? But listen, just because you can't see, because you can't make sense, because you don't understand, doesn't mean that God is not working. We put our faith in the one who sees everything, who knows everything, who understands how it can all fit and work together. God is the one. Like I said, he's sovereign. He has the ability to do absolutely anything, no limitations. We need to put our trust, our faith in God because without faith, it's impossible to please him. We know all things work together. 
All things work together, not separately, not independently. They work together. They're continually working together. God is in control. And moment by moment, God is arranging and rearranging all things for our good. We can't isolate one trouble or one problem in our life and say, well, this whole thing isn't going to be good because of this. It's okay because it's just a part of all things, right? And God's promise to us is all things work together. Sometimes we look at something and we, we try to take, take our hands on that and say, yeah, I don't want to let go of that. I don't want to give that to God. I don't know what he can do. God can do all things. Do we really truly believe this? All things work together. They work together. Somehow he blends it, he mixes it, he works it together and it always comes up good. It's like baking cookies. You've got sugar and butter and some eggs, some flour, a little salt. I have no idea what salt does in cookies. Somebody that has some insight, enlighten me. I've made many, many batches of cookies and I will always put the salt in, but I have no idea why. But listen, it takes more than sugar to make cookies. But I can tell you if you leave the sugar out, you're not gonna have very good cookies. All things have to blend together to make something really, really yummy. This week in our, our small group, Annie, Annie Bredding made a, uh, a salad and had this green goddess dressing. Um, it sounds great, it looked great, it tasted amazing. I love, I love this dressing. I found out that night that in that dressing was anchovies. I have never eaten an anchovy in my life. Anybody ever eat anchovies? Okay, some of you like them. I, I've never eaten one. I never wanted to eat one. I can't believe that this had anchovies in it. But it tasted amazing. This is what, this is what those look like. That was in this dressing. And I can tell you, whatever was else was in there, this was part of it, and it was amazing. I would never choose to eat an anchovy by itself. I don't think I ever will. But put it in Green Goddess dressing, I'll eat that every day. Blend it up in some stuff and make it. I'm telling you, it was really, really good. If you want the, the recipe to find out, ask Annie. Find Annie. I can put you in touch with her. But... It's, it's just a, a picture of how things work together for good. I would have never thought an anchovy was in that. Why would anchovies be in a salad dressing? But it works together for good. And good doesn't mean for your pleasure. It doesn't mean for your comfort or for your prosperity or for your health for that matter. Not even for your joy here on this earth. God works all things together for good. Not necessarily for the present, but he is working things for good eternally. And he is working and shaping and making all things work out for your good and for his purposes. You might find yourself in need. You might be experiencing a need, a huge need in your life, but it's just going to show you that he, he can make a way. He allows us to go through some experiences to prove that he is a, a very present help in time of need. Listen to what I can tell you. The things that we face, the things that we go through, the challenges in life, all are part of the ingredients of God shaping us and making us who he wants to be, who he wants us to be. It's part of him making us more like his son Jesus. It's part of us becoming more godly. So I say, whatever the circumstances, I, can, I, I should be able to give thanks. I should be able to give joy. I should be able to, to, to face it without a problem because God is working that together in my life for good and for his purpose. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come. I've talked a little too long here, but I hope that you get the point today. It's the, it's the, the experiences in life that a lot of us, I mean, you might not pick up the phone some, someday because you're afraid of what's going to happen on the other end of that line. There's certain things that you don't do because you're, you're afraid of what, how that's going to turn out. And you avoid some things because you're looking for, for comfort and uh, contentment and you're making things peaceful and easier in your life. But re the reality is God 
is at work in our lives as, as, as believers. He's at work, and he promises all things. Can you say all things? All work things. together. Say all things work together. For good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. God is going to fulfill his purpose in your lives. He's going to fulfill his purpose and he's going to work it for good. Here's, here's how I want us to, to respond this morning. That verse, Romans 8, 28, is the connector. It takes everyday life that we try to we try to avoid a lot of things. You know, don't watch the news. Ah, oh, it's so dis- discouraging and depressing. We, I hear all these statements. Don't do this, don't do that. Don't go here, don't go there. You know, uh, let's just live our lives with faith in Jesus. Let's trust that he knows how to take the broken things in our lives and he's gonna work it, shape it, make it, mix it, do whatever he can. And he promises that it's gonna be good your good, not what you think you need. I can't tell you how many times I thought I needed something, but I didn't really need it. God knows, and he's, his promise is that he's working it for good.